Hello, and welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor, co-founder and co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. In studio with me is FFRF Patrick O'Reilly Legal Fellow, Hirsch Josie. Hi, great to be here and great to be here with you, Annie Laurie. Nice to have you here. This show is being pre-recorded because we're in Denver or heading there for our annual FFRF convention this week. And we will have lots of incredible speakers there, so stay tuned for some coverage from that event. On today's show, we're promoting a new campaign to posthumously pardon free-thinking icon D.M. Bennett, who was unjustly prosecuted, convicted, and imprisoned at the hands of Anthony Comstock, the famous Anthony Comstock. And joining us is Bob Corn Revere, chief counsel at the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, better known as FIRE, which is the organization behind the campaign to pardon D.M. Bennett. Bob, we want to start this episode with a video from your organization made to promote sure. this campaign. Is that okay? Absolutely. So we want to help introduce our audience to D.M. Bennett and what this campaign is about. President Biden, it's never too late to right a wrong. History is full of some pretty terrible injustices. Just take the story of D.M. Bennett, for instance. D.M. Bennett was a thinker, writer, and publisher of The Truth Seeker. In post-Civil War America, Bennett was quite well known for writing that the quest for truth should not be dictated by tradition, religion, or authority, but by reason and scientific method. Controversial in his time, yeah, but nothing in his writings remotely fell outside what the First Amendment was designed to protect. But this ordinary American was put on trial and found guilty just for expressing his beliefs. You see, Bennett was also a leader seeking to repeal what is often called the Comstock Act. This law was used to prosecute literature, art, and even scientific texts that Comstock thought to be obscene. A professional anti-vice crusader, Comstock would fondly call it my law. It was framed as legislation against obscenity, but its vague and expansive wording allowed the prosecution of anything Anthony Comstock considered immoral. This included prosecuting even opponents of the law, like Bennett himself. Bennett was prosecuted and incarcerated under the Comstock Act, serving 11 of the 13 months of hard labor in a New York prison. Let's not mince words. The prosecution of this ordinary American for expressing a political opinion is grossly unconstitutional, violates the letter and spirit of the First Amendment, and is a stain on America's commitment to free speech. But you know the worst part? The law, the Comstock Act, is still on the books. You see, the development of First Amendment law from the 20th century essentially beat the Comstock Act down to its last breath. But the law itself was never repealed in all those years. Now, 145 years after Bennett was jailed, the law is showing signs of life, as some judges are toying with bringing back Victorian-era legal standards. Recent cases in Texas and even the Supreme Court have threatened to resurrect the Comstock Act, putting everyone's First Amendment freedoms at risk. And I do mean everyone, including you. The moment the government and its actors can censor and punish you for speech they disagree with is the second that free speech dies. We can't let that happen. Anthony Comstock's cold, dead hands should not be allowed to reach from beyond the grave to claw back America's hard-won constitutional rights. And that's why FIRE calls on President Biden to pardon Mr. Bennett, whose only crime was speaking his mind. President Biden, it's never too late to do the right thing. Pardon D.M. Bennett for his conviction under this unjust law. Very good. <laughs> so, uh, Bob, we'll get a little bit more into uh, the law and the First Amendment later, but let's talk first about an article that you wrote in Reason Ma Magazine arguing that President Biden should pardon Bennett. What makes you so passionate about this issue in particular? Well, I think the uh, prosecution of D.M. Bennett uh, represents everything that's wrong, uh, giving the government power to prohibit various kinds of speech that it describes as being beyond, beyond the pale. And uh, the Comstock Act exemplifies that. It was adopted in 1872, ostensibly to prohibit obscenity, but because it was so broadly worded, and because constitutional law had not developed yet at that time, it was used to prosecute everything from uh, art to literature, scientific and medical texts, and in Bennett's case, an opponent of the Comstock Act itself. Bennett was largely prosecuted because he was the principal driver behind a petition drive to repeal the Comstock Act. But on a pretext, he was convicted of distributing an anti-marriage 
text that someone else had written. And this just shows what can go wrong when you license the government to have that much control over speech. And so that prompted us to think of uh, a, a campaign to bringing this to the public attention and to illustrate just how the Comstock Act was in the 1870s a threat, but continues to be as some people in the political world are trying to resurrect the Comstock Act to um, apply it in current America. Yeah, I think I think it's ingenious, Bob. Uh, and I had known of D.M. Uh, Bennett because he was a relatively well-known free thinker, but also a very strong yes. feminist and worked with his, I don't know if it's what? wife or partner, um, to free women. Um, but do you want to say a little bit more about uh, who D.M. D. Bennett was? Absolutely. Um, Bennett was the leading free thinker of his day. He founded uh, the Truth Seeker Journal in 1872, oddly enough, the very same year the Comstock Act was adopted. And uh, the masthead of the free thinker pretty much said it all. It described both what he championed as values, but also explained what he was against. And <laughs> I really have to read this from the masthead because it's right, really quite a long list. He said that the truth seeker was devoted to science, morals, free thought, free discussions, liberalism, sexual equality, labor reform, progression, free education, and whatever tends to elevate and emancipate the human race. But more importantly, he staked out a position against priestcraft, ecclesiasticalism, dogmas, creeds, false theology, superstition, bigotry, ignorance, monopolies, aristocracies, privileged classes, tyranny, oppression, and everything that degrades or burdens mankind mentally or physically. So he lived up to that tradition in the positions that he took and in his writings to the truth seeker. And he, he was, as you say, the leading um, editor, certainly the leading free thinker, free thought editor. Well, and uh, I should stress too, the truth seeker is still being published today. Yeah, not quite the same deal as it used to be, but still, that's nice. <laughs> so well, it was also a, a time when free thought was being taken more seriously in political circles around the United States, and you had the leading orator of the time, Robert Ingersoll, yes. being a champion of free thought and widely accepted as a political force, despite the fact that uh, uh, free thought uh, is not as easily accepted this this many years later in America. Well, we have more people who are religiously unaffiliated, and sure. you know, so I think we're making some progress. But as you point out, um, Anthony Comstock is coming from out of the grave now to try to ruin the lives of women and other people here in not just the 19th and the early 20th centuries, but now the 21st century. And it, it makes me feel so indignant that we could even be looking at this. Do you want to talk a little bit about who Anthony Comstock was? Sure. It's, it's really odd that Anthony Comstock is uh, really, at this point, an obscure historical figure. But for 40 years, he was the principal voice, the principal arbiter between what was moral and what was immoral in America. He really started as a vigilante, trying to root out anything he considered to be smut. Uh, he was uh, supported by the YMCA in New York that sent him to Washington to lobby for a federal obscenity law, which he did and did successfully in 1872. And not only did he get this very broad law enacted, but he was appointed a special agent of the post office by which he could personally enforce the law. And as I mentioned earlier, he wielded that law as a club to go after novels, uh, art, literature, uh, medical texts because he thought it taught they would or home medical guides because he thought it would teach women too much about their own bodies. Uh, he used it against anything involving contraception uh, or abortion. Uh, and those restrictions were written right into the law. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier as well, federal constitutional law had not yet developed to cope with these kinds of restrictions on speech. And that wouldn't happen until the 20th century and really well into the 20th century, halfway through uh, that century, 
before many of the restrictions of the Comstock Act were cut back by advances in First Amendment and constitutional law. And it wasn't just speech. It was action that, you know, he curtailed the ability of even information to flow about contraception, That's abortions, right. you know, uh, sex education. Absolutely. And it was anything that could be considered immoral or could be harmful to the morals of the youngest uh, child who could be in the audience. And he had a very broad concept of what that included. So, uh, Bob, earlier you used a very key word, uh, pretext, which is often what you see with these vague and overbroad uh, laws chilling speech. Yes. So can you go a little bit more into the pretext that was used to actually initially arrest D.M. Bennett? Yeah. Well, he was actually arrested a couple of times and convicted once. Uh, he, had, from the beginning, had been a strong opponent of uh, the Comstock Act. He had been instrumental in putting together a petition drive. He collected 70,000 signatures on a petition drive in uh, 1877 uh, to uh, have the law repealed. Uh, and as soon as he announced that uh, this was going to be submitted to um, uh, Congress, uh, Comstock arrested Bennett for the first time. And two of the publications contained in the truth seeker that he went after was a, um, a, a thing called an open letter to Jesus Christ, which was critical of religion, and also an obscure scientific paper that had previously been published in a scientific journal called How Do Marsupials Propagate Their Kind? Uh, <laughs> so the uh, indictment was so absurd that uh, the um, uh, federal officials in Washington looked at that, and despite the fact that a grand jury had handed down the indictment, just said, no, we're not going to go this far. We're not going to indict someone under an obscenity law or looking at uh, the mating habits of kangaroos and possums. Uh, so they, that uh, um, indictment was dropped. But the one that stuck was for distributing a copy of a pamphlet called Cupid's Yokes, which was uh, written by a free love advocate named Ezra Haywood. And uh, because Haywood was also prosecuted under the Comstock Act, um, Bennett offered to provide a copy of Yoke, Cupid's Yokes to anyone who requested it. So Anthony Comstock wrote a decoy letter under a fictitious name and asked for a copy of the pamphlet, which uh, Bennett supplied. And so the um, prosecution advanced under this, because he was distributed this uh, free love pamphlet. Um, and uh, this time the conviction was upheld. He was tried in 1879 and convicted under the Comstock Act and sentenced to 13 months of hard labor in Albany prison. Now, the real irony here is that Ezra Haywood, who I mentioned was also a target of Anthony Comstock, was convicted under the law for writing Cupid's Yokes, uh, but President Rutherford, Rutherford B. Hayes pardoned uh, Haywood, saying that he didn't think that the pamphlet was, was obscene. And so the president pardoned the writer of the pamphlet, but then refused to give a pardon to someone who simply distributed it on request. Yes, so that makes a very good case for the necessity of, you know, correcting the historic record, doesn't it? It does, I think. And... and and I wanted to ask you more about why, why posthumously pardon Bennett now. That's a question that we often get. And what, what is the value of a posthumous pardon? And I, I, I think it's illustrated a bit by an earlier pardon that we were able to, to get uh, a little over 20 years ago. Um, I petitioned the governor of New York uh, for um, a posthumous pardon for the comedian Lenny Bruce who had been convicted in 1964 of obscenity for doing basic comedy routines in an all-adult all uh, nightclub. And uh, that conviction, tragically, was still on the books. And we uh, uh, got the pardon granted in uh, 2003. And I think the New York Times sort of crystallized that when in its front page story about the Bruce pardon, 
said, uh, Mr. Bruce being dead is not expected to reap any immediate benefit from the pardon. <laughs> that, that is literally true. That's always the case in, in where you have a posthumous pardon. The person who's being pardoned, it's a little too late for them to benefit from it. But posthumous pardons have been granted throughout history because they serve an important symbolic value. One is they correct the institutional record by making clear that that action by the state was antithetical to the purposes for which our government exists. It also has precedential value, and it stands as sort of a pledge that we're not going to commit this kind of injustice in the future. Third, it corrects the reputational memory or helps restore the reputational memory of the person who was being, um, who was being pardoned and serves as a public apology for this kind of injustice. And, and finally, I think it benefits the person who issues the pardon because it puts that person on the right side of history by saying that these are the values that America stands for and that this action in our past violated those values. And we need to learn that lesson and go forward and not commit those kinds of injustices in the future. But I would add a fifth benefit which is, as you've already pointed out, we face the prospect of the Comstock Act being enforced again, with even some Supreme Court justices saying it's good law, with all that that entails. So this is such an ingenious way to call attention to the public about the harm. Well, I think it, it, it's all testimony to the idea that if we forget our history, we're, we're doomed to repeat it. And we see this. Um, again and again throughout history. And it also is an artifact of the way in which constitutional law works, where you have a law on the books and certain applications of it are declared to be unconstitutional. That doesn't make that law disappear. That law is still there. And unless you continue to reaffirm those values, uh, you can still have applications of that law coming back. And we see threats of that with the Comstock Act. Uh, for example, in a case that FIRE is handling in Texas, um, where a university president declined to allow a drag show, a PG-rated drag show on campus, even though he said it was uh, in violation of the Constitution for him to simply cancel it because he didn't like the subject matter. Um, the court that declined to issue an injunction cited the Comstock Act and talked about that history in upholding that decision. So the anti-free speech elements of the Comstock Act, that uh, it's not a direct application of the act, but it's referred to as historical precedent, uh, were sort of coming back to undermine free speech values. It also is obviously part of the abortion debate and in the question of whether or not uh, um, uh, abortion medication can be sent by mail. Uh, that issue came up in the uh, um, Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine case that uh, um, was heard by the Fifth Circuit and then ultimately by the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court ultimately rejected the case on standing grounds, um, but the Comstock Act was referenced in the briefing and at the oral arguments before the Supreme Court. So a law that many have assumed has been dead for nearly a century is back. So, Bob, I just want to ask you uh, two questions. You mentioned uh, West Texas, um, and I want to ask you about two other things that FIRE is working on when it comes to obscenity, and one is right here in Wisconsin uh, with us. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Dr. Joe Gal for us? You're going to have to give me more than that. Uh, sure. Uh, about the University of Wisconsin chancellor who was ultimately terminated uh, for some of his out of, uh, let's say, out of his job speech. Yes. Well, the question is whether or not uh, someone uh, involved in sexually oriented speech off the job can be fired from their university job because of that. And uh, fire is coming to that defense. Our adage is if the speech is protected, we will defend it. And uh, that's one of the cases in, in which we're involved. And just yesterday, if I recall, uh, fire just had a victory in a federal courts of appeals. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, we did in uh, the Sixth Circuit decision in the uh, Day case, uh, we had a woman who was uh, in pharmacy school who, because of her uh, social media activity, completely done on her own time under 
a screen name, not even her name is in which she was enrolled as a student, um, and uh, not referencing the university in any way, uh, they decided that uh, they could um, uh, penalize her as a pharmacy student simply because of her social media activity. It had nothing to do with the curriculum or with the school. Um, fortunately, uh, the, even though the district court uh, had uh, rejected the, uh, the complaint, uh, the Sixth Circuit said that the claims could go forward because this kind of speech is protected speech, speech in someone's personal life has nothing to do with school, and the, the state school has no constitutional ability to, uh, to sanction it. Now, I have to say, this was a decision on a motion to dismiss. It's not a final decision on the merits, but it does uh, indicate that when people engage in speech on their own time, it is presumptively protected under the First Amendment. I wonder if you can give us an update on a case that we've been watching where we have given student activist awards of $5,000 to the student plaintiffs. And that's that case in Texas where uh, the students had arranged a benefit drag show for um, a group that, that helps uh, LGBTQ people. And the chancellor or the president of this public university had um, axed the whole thing and they're suing. I, I, have, I haven't heard an update lately. Yes, that was the uh, the case that I mentioned earlier, WT Spectrum versus um, Wendler, where um, the um, group had uh, requested the ability and then scheduled uh, a drag show as a benefit. Uh, the university president, uh, ultimately just on his own authority, uh, canceled the, uh, the show and said that it was not going to happen on his watch. And in his words, even if the law of the land appears to require it. Uh, and giving he, religious he, rationale because he was religious. Exactly. I mean, he, he cited um, uh, religious uh, sources for uh, for his concerns and also claimed that uh, he thought it was offensive to women. But, uh, you know, maybe so. That doesn't mean that it's unprotected by the, the First Amendment. And you can question his assumptions on that anyway. Nonetheless, uh, the, the district court uh, that, uh, that heard the case uh, uh, dismissed the case uh, and declined to grant an injunction. Um, and this was the same court that cited the uh, Comstock Act as historic precedent for how you can't assume that the speech is necessarily going to be protected. Uh, that case is now before the Fifth Circuit, and we're awaiting the decision. Okay, so there's the appeal. That's what I wondered if there'd been anything. Oh, yeah. I do want to circle back to the issue of abortion because um, the Comstock Act technically wasn't repealed, but Little by little, you know, Margaret Sanger in the 30s repealed, got some of it repealed, which was very wonderful because she'd been prosecuted. Um, and right. then, you know, the uh, Griswold versus uh, Connecticut in 65, I think, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. said that okay. married people had a right to privacy for contraception. And then the Bear decision right. came down. And then Roe versus Wade came down in 73. So basically, those gutted uh, the Comstock Act. But when the Supreme Court, the new Trump Supreme Court, with its extremist majority, uh, issued the Dobbs decision overturning Roe versus Wade. I think that's when the anti-abortionists and the extremists saw, oh, we can bring back the Comstock Act. Is that right? There are elements of that I would agree with and others that uh, uh, not so much. And there are also other cases in the history of First Amendment uh, development that uh, spoke directly to the Comstock Act most among them, uh, United States versus Roth, which was in 1957, uh, on uh, the standard for what constitutes obscenity. Um, and there it rejected the sort of 19th century um, legal doctrines and that uh, the Comstock Act was, was based on. Um, but a lot of this goes to the overall breadth of the Comstock Act itself. And here, just so you get a sense of it, here's what the law said. It said, no obscene, lewd, or lascivious book, pamphlet, picture, paper, print, or other publication of an indecent character or article or thing designed or intended for the prevention of contraception or pro procuring of an abortion or any article or thing intended or adapted for any indecent or immoral use or nature shall be carried in the mail. So stunningly broad. And it was because of the development of constitutional law through the 20th century with the Roth decision, with uh, 
Griswold versus Connecticut, as you mentioned, and so on, that uh, made most of those provisions unenforceable. And there have been other decisions along the way as well. Uh, and so I, um, I, you know, I one, one of the things that you learn as, as a First Amendment lawyer, I guess a lawyer in any field, is that no victory is ever permanently won and you have to continue to fight and restore those principles on which uh, the protections and the constitutional values are based. And so this is just another example of where old and bad arguments are resurfacing, and we have to, once again, uh, go and, and fight to, uh, to maintain the principles that have been hard won through the past century. I have just a follow-up question, and that is that if the Comstock Act were enforced, we can see right away that um, the males couldn't be used to send a, a medication abortion pills, which you know are being used um, around the country, especially women in banned states are managing to order it through the mail. But right. if if you couldn't use any shipping, and I think that's what people are saying, it wouldn't just apply to U.S. Postal Service; it would apply to FedEx. This is my question to you then this could shut down all the abortion clinics altogether because they all um, depend on shipping of equipment, shipping of their office supplies. Everything has to come, quote unquote, through the mail. Is that right? Well, no, the shipping services aren't the U.S. mail. The Comstock Act was adopted specifically to, to deal with the mail. Uh, now, there would be a question, further questions of whether or not other legislation could be adopted in that, uh, in that space. But uh, that, that's not something that would just spring back into, uh, into force in the way if you uh, overturned some of the precedents um, limiting the application the Comstock Act would do. But private carriers would probably be targeted right away because that would get around the law. That's hard to predict. What I can say is that uh, the sort of blueprint for a conservative administration project 2025 mm -hmm. does make reference to the Comstock Act. You kind of have to, in the 922 pages of that, you kind of have to dig into the footnotes to find the uh, Comstock Act reference, but you'll find it there. And I just wanted to ask you one question, and this is mostly for our viewers. Uh, we can see in your background a uh, very nice painting of, I believe, you before the Supreme Court of the United States. Can you tell our viewers a little bit more of how that uh, amazing uh, picture came to come? Uh, well, it's it's the product of a couple of things. One is uh, if you argue in front of the Supreme Court, uh, because of the fact that cameras aren't allowed in courts, including the Supreme Court, uh, for the most part, uh, this is a, a artist's rendering of an argument that I did uh, in a case called United States versus Playboy Entertainment Group. And um, uh, that was the uh, art that was used on the, the evening news uh, that evening, and I was able to acquire it from the artist. That's a very nice souvenir, Bob. Right. Uh, now, we just want to talk again about the petition so people know You've got a petition. Is it up at your website? Uh, it is. Uh, and um, our website is www.thefire.org. Uh, we have a take action campaign going on right now. If you could find that uh, uh, at the website, it allows you to fill in a, uh, uh, um, a box there that can uh, forward your message on to President Biden. And we're hoping a lot of people will uh, join in our campaign to find uh, justice for D.M. Bennett. And we will be contacting the 40,000 members of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, those who give us their I emails in a way, <laughs> and letting them know about this. Sure. Well, uh, Bob, thank you so much for coming on to our show this week. If you would like to support FIRE's petition to posthumously pardon D.M. Bennett, you can scan the QR code on your screen or visit thefire.org to email President Biden directly. And again, you will be hearing from us, too. And that wraps up this week's episode of FFRF's Ask an Atheist. Thank you again so much, Bob. Thanks so much for having me. A new episode of our broadcast TV show, Free Thought Matters, airs this weekend. And talk about Timely. Uh, Dan, Dan co-president Dan Barker and I uh, continue the conversation about Anthony Comstock and the women he persecuted 
with author Amy Sohn, who wrote the book, The Man Who Hated Women, Sex, Censorship, and Civil Liberties in the Gilded Age. You know, I was born the same year as Roe in 1973. So it's, it's interesting for me as a woman, um, you know, who came of age in an era of, of relative, you know, what, what we believed were relatively assured abortion rights to see that whole landscape changing and the impact that it's having uh, on women and on, and on reproductive providers. So you, you can get more details again about Comstock and all his harm there. You can watch that episode soon on FFF's YouTube channel. And don't miss FFRF's weekly radio show, Free Thought Radio. This Thursday, Annie Laurie Gaylor and Dan Barker will speak with Matthew D. Taylor, author of the upcoming book, The Violent Take by Force, the Christian movement that is threatening our democracy. You can find Free Thought Radio at FFRF.org slash radio or wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to check out the latest episode of We Dissent, the only podcast hosted exclusively by women constitutional attorneys discussing state church separation. Listen and subscribe to We Dissent wherever you get your podcasts or check us out online at we-dissent.org. Finally, if you want more information about the Freedom From Religion Foundation, check out our website at ffrf.org. If you're a member already, thank you. If not, please join us. See you next time on FFRF's Ask an Atheist.